the West is burning. And it has been for quite some time. But recently, things have gotten worse. Much worse. As of June 2021, 75% of the Western United States is experiencing the most severe drought ever recorded by the U.S. Drought Monitor. 22 large fires have burned over 220,000 acres in 10 states, and wildfire season is only just beginning. California already experienced its worst ever wildfire season in 2020, which killed 31 people, burned over 4.1 million acres and 10,000 buildings, and cost over $10 billion in damages. That was on top of a 2020 fire season, which overall totaled $16.5 billion in damages, the third costliest season on record, only trailing 2017 and 2018 for that distinction. Since 2000, 15 fires have cost more than $1 billion in damages. In fact, the five largest fire seasons on record have all occurred since 2005, and the number of large fires has more than doubled since 1984. This is all to say that wildfires are destructive, and they're getting worse. The question of what we can do about that, though, isn't very easy to answer. We've had decades of fire suppression and unsustainable development patterns in fire-prone areas, and we know climate change is making wildfires bigger and hotter, making wildland firefighting that much more difficult. We also know that most wildfires occur on public lands, and that fighting wildfires on these lands requires coordination, cooperation, and trust among the many groups involved. So let's learn how we fight wildfires on public lands. In order to do that, we need to understand how wildfires are started in the first place and why they're becoming increasingly more destructive. The vast majority of wildfires are started by humans, intentionally or not. In the last 30 years, more than 80% of wildfires in the United States were caused by humans, while most others were started by lightning strikes. Human-caused wildfires can be started by anything from unattended campfires to fireworks, but there's really no shortage of human-induced causes. For example, the Car Fire, one of California's most destructive wildfires to date, started with a flat tire. A pull-behind trailer blew out its tire, causing the rim of the wheel to scrape against the asphalt. The resulting sparks would trigger a fire that would come to envelop the Shasta Whiskey Town Trinity National Recreation Area, cost over $1.5 billion in damages, and cost eight people their lives. Still further, the campfire, California's most destructive, was the result of faulty electrical lines. That fire would go on to burn over 150,000 acres and cost 85 people their lives. And unfortunately, some wildfires are even started on purpose. Arsonists can and do start wildfires. But regardless of whether or not they are started by humans, all evidence points to wildfires becoming bigger hotter, faster, and more destructive. And there are a couple reasons for that. The first actually being fire suppression. Now, that may seem counterintuitive at first. How can suppressing fires cause them to be more destructive? Well, it turns out fires can actually be good for forests. In fact, some species of trees have specifically evolved to depend on fires to reproduce. Lodgepole pines, for instance, have what are called serotonous cones, which are sealed shut with a resin that is only melted by the heat of a wildfire, after which the cone is able to open up and release its seeds. Or take shrubs in the buckthorn family, which have heat-activated seeds. They lay dormant until the heat of a fire, or certain chemical signals associated with it, tell them to wake up and begin germinating. But the sorts of fires that are good for these forests aren't the sorts of fires we're seeing. What we're seeing are out-of-control infernos, which are partly the result of decades of fuel buildup. This fuel includes a dense understory of dead wood and vegetation, which helps fires spread from the ground into the canopy of the larger trees. But what we should be seeing are smaller, more frequent fires, which actually have the benefit of fuel reduction. They keep the understory cleared out so fires don't grow out of control, and they allow those lodgepole pines and buckthorns to reproduce and keep forests healthy. For decades now, though, we've had a policy of complete fire suppression, which means even those small, healthy fires are much less prevalent. And you might be surprised to learn that this policy of fire suppression actually started with the U.S. Forest Service itself. In 1910, several fires known as the Big Blowup burned over 3 million acres in Idaho, Montana, and Washington. The Forest Service determined that the only way to prevent such widespread destruction from happening again 
was to completely suppress wildfire on the landscape. Massive amounts of federal resources were poured into a national policy of fire suppression, including the introduction of Smokey the Bear in 1944. Of course, the Forest Service couldn't have known at the time that fires can be good for forests. The science of fire ecology didn't become well known until the 1960s. All they saw were massive fires threatening timber harvests, and in later years, people. Because while fire suppression has certainly played a role in our increasingly larger wildfires, the role of human development patterns can't be forgotten either. As the United States has continued to grow, we have increasingly developed outward from cities. As we grow outward, we occupy areas that were once, well, wild. And our homes and buildings now brush right up against that wilderness. These wild areas are, of course, where wild fires occur, which puts our homes and buildings right in the line of fire, literally. Some of the most destructive fires in history have been the ones that were closest to cities and towns. And the more those cities and towns continue to grow, the more danger they will be in. And of course, there's something else at play here too. Something that's making an already difficult to manage situation even more difficult to manage. And that's climate change. See, there are several factors that play a role in a wildfire's ability to start and spread. Things like temperature, soil moisture, fuel load, humidity, and wind speed all come into play here. And in many cases, these are exacerbated by climate change. What we're seeing with climate change in the West is places getting hotter and drier. Hotter environments mean wildfire seasons are getting longer. In some cases, seasons are becoming months longer, as snowpacks melt earlier and forests stay dry for longer. On the other hand, drier environments mean fuel loads are easier to ignite and easier to burn, which means that a stray campfire ember or summer lightning strike is that much more likely to start a wildfire. And that drought we talked about? It's also made worse by climate change, which means there's not exactly a lot of rain to help extinguish these blazes. And so we have all of these factors making wildfires so much worse. Fire suppression, unsustainable development patterns, and climate change are all converging to create raging infernos burning across our public lands. So how do we fight them? How do forest managers fight wildfires on public lands? There are two main approaches, direct and indirect fire management. Indirect fire management actually relies on setting fires. Much like the small, low-grade fires that healthy forests rely on, forest managers use prescribed burns to mimic those natural fire regimes. A prescribed burn works like this. The first step is actually to adopt a fire management plan, which details how the fire will be used, how big it should get, what its fuels will be, when it can be lit, and how it will be put out. After that, firefighters then need to wait for the right conditions to set a prescribed fire. If it is too windy or too hot, prescribed fires can be called off because they run the risk of getting out of control. A lot of planning is required to make sure a prescribed burn can go ahead. They may even be called off the same day they are planned. In this case, managers may call for mechanical methods of fuel reduction like chainsaws or bulldozers just to make sure there's at least a little bit of fire management going on. But if a plan is in place and conditions are ideal, a prescribed burn can go ahead. And the first step is to start a test fire. This fire is started at the corner of a site which is downwind from the rest of the burn area and has a fire break behind it. A fire break is a line where fuel and other vegetation is removed so that a fire can't jump past it. This may be created by firefighters themselves, or they can use a natural one such as a road or stream. If the test fire is successful, fire managers then start what is known as the backfire, which again has a fire break behind it and the wind blowing toward it. This ensures that the fire moves slowly and can be managed properly by the burn crew. After the backfire, firefighters set the flank fires, which are on the sides. Flank fires again have fire breaks or the burn crew behind them and move inward toward the advancing backfire. If all is going well, firefighters can start the final fire, the head fire. The head fire moves the quickest because the wind is behind it. But since the back and flank fires have already burned all of their fuel, they act as natural fire breaks to the oncoming head fire. From there, the burn crew cleans up any remnant embers and small fires and the burn is complete. And it's important to remember that this is a meticulous process. If at any point something isn't going according to plan, the prescribed burn is called off. But for those big wildfires, you can't just call them off. In one sense though, fighting a wildfire is like lighting a prescribed burn. It's all about containment. With a raging wildfire, you're not going to put it out. 
Instead, you need to make sure it doesn't spread and will eventually burn all the fuel in its area to the point it will actually put itself out. And to do that, it requires a lot of time, people, and money. Modern wildfire outfits employ thousands of people across the U.S. and use everything from helicopters to Boeing 747s to help fight these raging infernos. It all starts after a wildfire is detected, hopefully early on. Now, if it hasn't gotten too big, dropping water from a helicopter or flame retardant from a plane might be enough to stop it in its tracks. But if not, we have to send in the smoke jumpers. These are highly trained firefighters who actually parachute down to the fire to try and contain it early on. They use similar techniques to what we see in prescribed burns. They build fire breaks and clear vegetation from the edges of the fire to try and prevent it from spreading. Backup crews will build secondary fire breaks even further out in the event that the primary fire breaks fail. Crews will also use streams and roads as built-in fire breaks to assist in shaping a containment area. Helicopters and planes are still being used at this time as well, all in an effort to contain the fire as much as possible. And remember, containment is the goal here. These fires are too big and too hot to extinguish. So the best we can hope for is to prevent the fire from spreading so that it eventually just burns itself out, hopefully before causing too much damage. Wildfires are just inherently dangerous and unpredictable, making wildland firefighting hard enough on its own. But what we've seen recently, these out of control megafires are making it that much more difficult and dangerous. And with climate change making the problem worse, Wildfires look to be a daunting challenge to overcome in the upcoming decades. But as we learn more about fires' role in the ecosystem and our own role in making them worse, we can learn not to stop them, but to live with them. If you enjoyed this video and want to learn more about the world's protected places, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.